So in this video, I'm going to be talking about how to organize life's diversity, how to classify different species into groups that show us who's more related to who. So two attempts to do that, we're going to talk about two systems. I'll talk a little bit about Linnaeus's system of different categories to put groups in, or called taxa. And then we'll spend most of our time talking about a newer system using phylogenetic trees to try and organize life's history. So Linnaean taxa, just the idea that maybe we defined certain categories and we tried to assign um, each species to some of those categories. So if you can think about maybe trying to organize all the music that exists into different categories, maybe we create broad categories like rock or country um, or classical, and then maybe there are subcategories that we can kind of further use to describe different types of music. I just want you to imagine that we try to do that for all the different types of species. And so we've kind of created eight different category groups, um, some of them being very broad, like domain. And then as we kind of proceed down these subgroups, it's getting more and more specific until each um, species gets a specific species kind of name. And so domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And we might ask you to kind of broadly know that order. And so just as a quick mnemonic, to help you, maybe Dear King Philip came over for good soup could be an example um, uh, to help you kind of remember that order. Um, just to give you an example of how that helps us kind of classify, what if we were to think about our own classification, uh, which groups do we belong to as humans? You definitely don't need to memorize these for this discussion, um, but we're considered eukaryotes, but lots of other organisms are too, like mushrooms, ants, lions, uh, among many others. Um, we could get more specific by then going to our kingdom. We belong to the animal kingdom, so that would knock mushrooms out. If we were to go further, we could say that we're in the chordate phylum, and that would knock um, ants out because they don't have a backbone um, like we do and like lions. And then if we were to eventually go further, we would see we would eventually uh, focus in on us. The other thing about the Linnaean system that, well, just uh, briefly point out is it sort of suggested a two-name system for, for identifying species specifically. Um, the first name is the genus of the uh, species, so um, our own scientific name is Homo sapiens. Kind of both names together constitute the species um, name itself. Um, and typically we uh, capitalize the first name and don't capitalize the second name and we italicize. So if you kind of look um, uh, out for that, you'll see that that's frequently used by biologists to refer to a species um, so that everybody knows what we're talking about. All right, um, so that's really all I want to say about the Linnaean system. And I really want to spend the rest of our time introducing these phylogenetic trees, also called cladograms. Um, and the goal of these trees is really to do two things. We really want to determine um, uh, what species are more or, or less related to other species. And we also want to, um, if we can along the way, kind of determine what evolutionary events occurred in the uh, formation of the species that we're seeing today. Or can we determine the phylogeny of that species, um, what happened when in evolutionary history. So um, this is, might be what a tree kind of broadly looks like. Um, I would say that the biggest mistake students make is sometimes they read this left to right. So if these represent four different species, A, B, C, and D, sometimes they kind of think that just, you know, species A came first and then let, uh, eventually became species B and some organisms from species B became C. But that's really not what we're saying. We're saying that look to the root of the tree, um, and then what we're saying is that perhaps over evolutionary time, if we assume that it occurred kind of uh, time past as we move up this tree, that some kind of common ancestor here, which is really what every um, uh, branching point represents, also called a node, um, really represents some kind of common ancestor species to, um, in this case, all four of the species. And then uh, speciation occurred, and some uh, groups went this way, leading to modern species A, and other groups went this way, leading to modern species B, C, and D. Um, then there was another common ancestor um, to B, C, and D, and maybe um, they went their two separate ways. 
And so um, really what we're trying to show in a phylogenetic tree is that everybody started at the bottom and then maybe different paths, different evolutionary events led to each of the species A, B, C, and D. So A went down this path, B went down this path, C went down this path, and D went down this path. And that's also useful because that uh, we can use these trees to figure out who's more closely related to who. Uh, B and C share all of this history right here, and so they have the most in common. Uh, D has quite a bit in common as well. D has all of this history in common with B and C. Um, but A is pretty distantly related because A only shares this much in common with B, C, and D. All right. So um, something else that I just want to make sure you're aware of is that sometimes we kind of um, uh, orient these trees differently. Um, I think most often we'll show them this way, kind of um, uh, showing this uh, as time proceeds, as, as divergences occur, uh, we'll go up. But sometimes I've also seen phylogenetic trees sit on their side. So just look for the root of the tree and then just see um, when branching starts, we're saying that that's um, where speciation starts to happen. So in this particular um, orientation, we're saying that time is proceeding going from left to right. So sometimes that can be a little confusing. Um, also, sometimes this confuses students that um, anytime we show a common ancestor branching and maybe certain organisms um, um, head um, down one evolutionary path, um, whereas other groups uh, go down a different evolutionary path, I just want you to imagine that it doesn't matter which, which path goes left and which path goes right. Uh, in other words, this tree over here is the exact same. I just showed D going left this time and B and C going right. And so I want you to imagine that at every branching point, you can essentially rotate it around and it would still create the same tree. Both trees here show B and C still the most closely related. All right, and the last thing we want to do is just um, give you a little bit of practice with something you'll do in class, which is reading a tree to build a chart and then using a chart to build a tree. Um, and so what if we show these little hash marks um, saying that this is when that evolutionary event occurred? So hopefully it makes sense that if A went down this path right here, um, that A doesn't have any of these three traits. And so maybe in a chart like this, we use pluses and zeros. Pluses means you have the trait, zeros means you do not. Um, and so A would be zeros for all three traits. That doesn't necessarily mean that A didn't evolve anything or didn't change. It just means that it didn't evolve the traits that we're highlighting. Meanwhile, this vascular tissue trait maybe is something that um, if it evolved right here, um, B, C, and D will all have them. So let's put pluses uh, for those because they all have vascular tissue. Next, we could go to the seeds um, trait and we see that it only evolved down this path leading to B and C eventually. Um, so B and C have seeds, but D does not because D went down this path instead. And then finally flowers, if flowers evolved right here, then it evolved on the path to C only and not B or D. And so that would just be a quick example of um, reading a tree and showing us where the traits um, are present. And then the other thing we might want you to do is just the exact opposite. So what if we gave you uh, the traits um, on a chart and then who has them and who doesn't, can you then build a tree? Um, and so there are lots of ways to do this. Typically I like to look for uh, species that have, uh, a lot of the species that have the trait. So it looks like a lot of species have this four limb body plan. So maybe that came first. It looks like species B doesn't have any of the traits. So let's show them um, maybe branching early off the common root. So let's show species B over here. And then maybe on this other branch leading eventually to A, C, and D, we'll have four limbs, okay? Um, then we could look for the next trait. Um, it looks like C and D have this next trait, eggs, but A does not. 
So maybe we want to show a branch again, maybe on one branch show A, the species who doesn't have the trait, and then C and D will eventually come um, over on this branch, and let's show that branch as having the egg. And then finally, hair. Um, it looks like only C has hair, so let's show a branch again, C and D, and only on the path leading to C, let's show hair. Why does this help us? Because again, this gives us a sense of who's most closely related. Maybe C and D are the most closely related. Um, and the other thing it gives us is a sense of the order in which different traits evolved. So you could say, what's the phylogeny of species D? Well, maybe they came from a, a long, um, long ago ancestor who evolved four limbs, and then a more recent ancestor who also had this egg structure before um, perhaps leading broadly to the species D. All right, so um, we just tried to introduce kind of basic ideas of classification in this video, kind of the old system of different category groups called taxa that we placed organisms in based on common definitions, and a more, com uh, a more recent attempt to use these phylogenetic trees to show the history of evolutionary adaptation.